morning again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we prepare to come into your presence and the sense of awe and trembling, open your word and hear what it has to say to us. May we not lose sight of this moment we have just had where we have proclaimed that nothing is better than you. Lord, I pray that we believe that. Forgive us if there is anything in our life that we have put above you, that we have longed for more than you, that we have in one way or another or a thousand others said is better than you. Lord, we have said what a beautiful name it is. The fourth man in the fire, time after time. Lord, we have boldly proclaimed that we trust in God. Father, I pray that we know what we have said and we believe what we have said. Lord, forgive us if we have uttered the words of those songs without urgently understanding that they apply to our lives right now in this moment. Father, forgive us if we have sung the words that were on the screen and not sincerely accepted them as truth in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would continue the work that you have started as we open up in Job 38. Lord, that you would speak to us through the testimony of the scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, we are going to begin in Job 38 and remain there for much of today. While you're turning there, let me ask you a question. How many of you remember the incredible movie, the cinematic masterpiece, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? Raise your hands. Oh, yeah, some of y'all missing out. Some of y'all are missing out. Some of y'all are just too young. You need to go look it up. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Kevin Costner, right? Man, I love that movie. I've seen that movie so many times. It was one of my favorite movies in one phase of my life, and I've watched it over and over and over again. We could talk about Robin Hood for 30 minutes, but we, got, we can't do that, all right? Um, Robin Hood, as you will recall, just here's the big premise, since many of you haven't seen it or can't remember it. He returns home from fighting with King Richard in the Crusades, and he comes back and everything's in a mess. Most of the movie is spent with this, this drama between Robin Hood and the evil sheriff of Nottingham. And this evil sheriff has gone off the rails in the absence of the king who's off fighting in the crusades. Robin Hood, through the course of his adventures and fighting uh, the sheriff, he falls in love and is reunited with his childhood friend, Maid Marian who actually happens to be the cousin of the king. At the end of the movie, the, the sheriff is defeated and everything looks like it's going to end happily every after as we want all movies to do. And good stories should end that way, right? The scene automatically and just, just very suddenly it transitions and, and you're really not expecting it, though it's not totally unexpected. But you move out of this, this drama, this action-packed drama, into this scene that's in the middle of the forest. And, and there's this beautiful wedding unfolding before you in the middle of this beautiful forest. It's a serene setting. And there they are, Robin Hood and Maid Marian, about to get married by Friar Tuck, who happens to be my favorite character in the whole story. You gotta love Friar Tuck. And there's Friar Tuck, and he, he utters the words something like, any man who has reasons why these two should not be joined together, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. And then there's a dramatic pause, and you can hear the birds, and the flowers are falling, and everything looks perfect. And Friar Tuck then begins to continue, and he says, Then I now pronounce you, and just as he says the words you, somewhere out of view, off screen, you hear this bold, big voice say, 
Hold, I speak. And the camera pans around and you see these approaching soldiers on horseback slowly moving toward the crowd. And to the surprise and delight of everybody in attendance at this wedding, they see King Richard, played by Sean Connery. And suddenly, every knee bows in the presence of the king. The king then approaches the happy couple and he gives away the bride in marriage. While that's not a perfect illustration of what happens here at the end of the book of Job, it is somewhat how we might picture this scene. In the beginning of the book of Job, as we're introduced to the man and his family, we watch his world suddenly fall apart. A drama of chaos and madness begins to unfold. And we empathize with his pain and with his suffering. We can all empathize with it because on some level, Job's story is our story. Then as we move deeper into the book, in the middle of the book, we see this long discourse between Job and his friends. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. And they're trying to explain what has happened to Job and why it's happened to Job. We've spent the last few weeks unpacking that. There's all sorts of wonderful things in the middle of the the book about friendship and relationships and how to be a good friend and how not to be a good friend when things like this are happening. And while there's been a good bit of talking going on throughout the book of Job, God has remained silent. And in his silence, the friends of Job have spoken on behalf of God. And Job himself has proclaimed that he wants to talk to God about his situation. That he wants to approach God face to face. In fact, Job is very bold about that. We see it in places like Job 13, 1 through 3, where Job says, Look, my eyes have seen all this. My ears have heard and understood it. Everything you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. And then look at verse 3. He says, Yet I prefer to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case before God. I want an audience with the Lord, he says. In Job 23, 1 through 5, Job boldly professes, Starting in verse 2, today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. If only I knew how to find him so that I could go to his throne. I would plead my case before him and I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn how he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. If I knew where God was, I'd go to him right now, Job says. In Job 31, 35, he says, if only I had someone to hear my case. And then listen to this. Job says, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. In other words, I'm not hiding from God. Here I am. If he wants to find me, he can come here and talk to me. Let him answer me, Job says. We can all see, and I bet we can all agree, that those are some pretty big and bold statements. But let me ask you this, have you ever felt like that? Have have you ever felt like you deserved an answer from God and you wanted God to speak? Have you ever been so frustrated or so fearful? Or maybe perhaps even in the midst of a season of great faithfulness where you just wanted God to speak. You just wanted God to to say something. You just wanted to hear him speak to the matter at hand. I think we've all been there. So in the book of Job, we've heard from Job, we've heard from Job's wife, we've heard from Job's friends, and now in these final chapters, we're going to hear God speak. God burst onto the scene somewhat unexpectedly, but not totally unexpected, Kind of like that situation in Robin Hood. And God suddenly arrives and says, Hold, I have something to say. Look at chapter 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. He said, Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. 
Job probably knew right then this was going to be a tough conversation. (laughs) God goes on and he asks Job some questions. In fact, he asks him 77 questions. We're not going to read all of them. But these are some difficult questions. They're questions about cosmology and astronomy and oceanography and meteorology and zoology. Questions about philosophy and life. And the surprising thing is, is that virtually none of the 77 questions that God asked Job following that statement have anything to do with Job. They have nothing to do with his suffering or his pain or the questions that he's asked. They have nothing to do with what the friends have said over the course of their long discourses with Job. In other words, God doesn't really answer or even offer to answer Job's most pressing questions. Yet at the end of this, Job offers this. In fact, these are the very last words Job speaks in the book of Job. After hearing God speak, Job will say this. He said, I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words, and I am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. Church, this is what I want you to know today. I want you to know that God still speaks. He still speaks. He's still willing to speak. He still will speak. He still loves His people and wants to communicate with them. He still speaks. But here's what we have to grasp if we want God to speak to us and speak into our lives and our situations. We have to forget about the how and focus on the who. That's the big idea for today. Forget about the how and focus on the who. So many times people come to me and they say, Pastor Pete, I want God to speak to me. Pastor Pete, I need God to to talk to me about this. Pastor Pete, I need God's counsel and God's wisdom on this. And I want to hear from Him. Tell me, how how does God speak to you? How how will I know if it's God? How How will I know if it's His voice and not another? We get so focused on the how we forget to focus on the who. The reality is this church, God speaks in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of how God can speak. There's an infinite number of hows. There's no limit to how God can speak to His people. But here's another reality. The who of who God speaks to is very very narrow and is defined in Scripture. So this sermon is not about how God speaks. It's about who He speaks to. If you want God to speak, if you want God to show up and say something to you, you need to focus on the who, not the how. I know God speaks, and I know He will speak to you, and I know He'll probably speak to you in different ways than He spoke to me, but the who is what matters. So let's dive in. The first thing is this, the first kind of people or person God speaks to are people who know how to be silent. This isn't rocket science. You don't have to go to seminary and get a theology degree to figure this one out. God speaks to those who are quiet, those who shut up, those who listen. Let me just ask you, I mean, this is common sense kind of stuff here. Can you hear better when you're in a quiet place or a loud place? Can you hear better when you're in a room all by yourself or when you're in a stadium with 100,000 other people? The answer is you can hear the same. Your hearing doesn't change, but what you're able to hear changes immensely. See, in a quiet room, you can hear everything. Yesterday, my kids were all gone. Some were at a birthday party. Some were at this. My daughter was celebrating her birthday with some friends. They went to San Antonio with Abby and were shopping. I ended up at the house for a couple hours all by myself. Very rare, by the way. And I was sitting in the living room just praying. It was silent and quiet. And there was this bird that kept making this racket. Outside, and I thought it was like on the window seal right outside the window where I was. It was so loud in my ear, it was annoying me. And so I got up and I went and I opened the front door and I looked out on the porch and there was no bird. I figured out that bird was in a tree about 75, 100 feet from my house. But I could still hear it so clearly because the house was so quiet. I sat there a little longer and I heard the AC kick on. 
can only hear that when things are silent. You can hear everything, right, when things are quiet. Now, in a stadium packed with 100,000 people for a concert, let's say, you can hear the music and you can hear the crowd roar, but you might really struggle to hear somebody right next to you trying to talk to you. Your hearing isn't any different, but what you hear is very different. And this is how it is with the Lord. We can hear Him in the middle of the chaos. I'm not trying to say or put God in a box and say that that God can't speak to you when things are loud or chaotic, when your life's in a mess, when things around you are spinning out of control. Of course He can. God can speak in a lot of different ways, and God can show up and speak in any situation. But what I am saying is you have a much better chance of hearing Him when you're in a place that's silent. Finally, after 38 chapters of friends speaking and family speaking and Job speaking, after 38 chapters, everybody shuts up and takes a breath. Everyone gets quiet, and then God says, Hold, I speak. It says, Then the Lord answered Job from the world when he said, Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Oh my goodness, this is going to be a long conversation. That's the first question. Second question isn't any easier. Tell me, if you have understanding, who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know, because apparently you know everything, God says. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or how about this one? What supports its foundations, Job? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? He says, were you there? It goes on like that for a while. 77 questions. Again, this isn't the only way God can speak. We're not trying to put God in a box and say this is how God speaks every time. But we can notice that God is able to speak because things finally get quiet. In fact, Elihu, one of Job's friends, he notes that God can speak in thunderous ways, in thunderous voices. In Job 37, 1 through 5, he says, My heart pounds at this and leaps from my chest. Just listen to his thunderous voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He lets it loose beneath the entire sky, his lightning to the ends of the earth. Then there comes a roaring sound. God thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightning when his rumbling voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. I pray we get to hear that thunderous voice this week. He says the Lord can speak in loud, thunderous ways. The Lord can speak through nature. But that's all the how. Let's think about the who. It's normally in that still, small voice, in those places of silence, that you're able to hear God the best, even when He chooses to thunder. I think about Moses, there at the burning bush, up there on top of the mountain of God. I bet that was a pretty quiet place when God spoke. Or later, on top of the mountain of God, whenever He gets the Ten Commandments. I think about people like Jonah, sitting outside the city, still mad and frustrated and bitter about having to go to the people of Nineveh. We read about Jonah there in Jonah chapter 4, and there he is talking to God. But he's outside the city. He's by himself. He's in a quiet place where he hears from God. I think about the Apostle Paul. He's Saul at the time, but he's on the road to Damascus. He's walking on a road that would have been quiet. A place to think when Jesus shows up changes his life and the course of history forever or what about Samuel oh I love that one in first Samuel chapter 3 do you remember what happened to him the boy just a boy it says the boy Samuel starting in verse 1 he served the Lord in Eli's presence in those days the word of the Lord was rare and prophetic visions were not widespread people weren't hearing from God and one day Eli whose eyesight was failing was laying in his usual place Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was laying down in the temple of the Lord. Things are quiet. Day is ending. He's in a quiet place there in the temple. 
where the ark of God was located. And then the Lord called Samuel. He spoke. And Samuel answered and said, here I am. It was a quiet place. We're told in places like Mark 135 that Jesus went to quiet places to talk to God. It says in Mark 135, very early in the morning while it was still dark, while everybody else is still in bed, before the day really even got going, he's up and at him. It says he got up, he went out, and he made his way to what? The coffee shop? The taco hut? Social media? No. He went to a deserted place, and there he was praying. You know what? Deserted places happen to be pretty quiet, don't they? And Jesus frequently, according to Scripture, the testimony of it, frequently went to these quiet and deserted places to speak to and to hear from the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus tells us how to pray, what does he say? He says this in verse 6, but when you pray, he says, go into your private room. Shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your Father knows the things you need before you even ask Him. He says, shut the door. Go into a private place. Be in a place of silence. You see what I'm getting at? I'm not saying God can't speak to you in the middle of the noise and the chaos of life. I know He can. I've heard Him in those moments. I've sensed the Spirit of God in those moments, guiding and directing me when things are chaotic. But it's in the silence that I hear Him the most clearly. It's in the silence I hear Him the most frequently. How much silence do you have in your day? How often are you just in a silent space where God can speak to you. You know, in today's culture, it's very, very rare. We're just not comfortable with silence. We fill every ounce of silence with something. We're so connected and we're so concerned about so many things, it is almost never quiet in our lives. We don't even drive without the radio on because we need noise. We sleep with white noise machines going. You know, I never knew I needed it to be noisy to go to sleep until I got married. We've been married a little while, and Abby's like, we need one of those white noise machines. I'm like, why? She goes, to sleep better. I've been sleeping just fine my whole life in the quiet. But apparently, you need noise to go to sleep. The truth is, though, most of us are just really uncomfortable with silence. And so we fill up every silent moment and every silent space in our lives. I can remember as a kid camping out in the summer at my grandfather's house out at the ranch where we worked as kids with my dad and my uncle. We would do this a lot in the summer, sometimes in the school year, but my my grandfather had beautiful carpet grass. A lot of times we would just sleep on his front porch or just off of it out there in the grass underneath the stars when the weather was good. And every night after dinner, my, my grandfather would come out of his house with a big glass of tea and he would sit in this old metal rocking chair with his tea, and he would just sit there and rock on that front porch. And we always knew what the answer was, but we liked to ask him anyway, because we thought it was so funny as kids. We would say, hey, Paul, what are you doing? Because he would just sit there and just rock. And his answer would always be the same. He would always say, just watching the grass grow. And we thought that was so funny as kids. He had no text messages to tend to. He had no voicemails to go deal with. He had no emails to worry about. He didn't have a TV with 200 channels of nothing on it. But you know what he did have? A lot of silence in his life, unless we were in his front yard. Just time to watch the grass grow. I have a feeling we would all hear God speak a lot more if we just made some time to watch the grass grow. I have a feeling the world wouldn't be any worse off at all if we made a little more time to watch the grass grow. So many times we get so focused on the how, we forget the who of who God speaks to. It's people who are quiet. If we're looking for a pattern in Scripture to embrace, it would be a 
pattern of quietness and silence. Those are the people God speaks to. Here's, here's the second characteristics of those God speaks to in Scripture. We see this in Job's life. I believe God speaks to those who submit to his authority. He speaks to those who are willing to submit their lives to his authority. Now, it's clear that most people don't embrace silence or enjoy sitting in silence. And it's also true when it comes to authority that most people don't appreciate or embrace or long for authority in their life. Most of us, in fact, despise authority. I believe that our flesh very naturally rebels against any kind of authority in our life. Our first instinct is always to rebel against authority. Whether it's God's authority that he set up in the home or in the church or in the government or in the world, we just, we're naturally, we want to rebel against it. And most of us, at some point in our lives, we, we, we become accustomed to authority. We, we tolerate authority because we have to. But we really don't want to submit to authority. And, and I get it. That comes usually out of a long sense of experience where there are many, many bad authorities in the world who take advantage of their authority and they abuse it. And many do abuse their authority. I won't argue that with you. There are many who lord their authority over us. Peter even goes so far in his epistle to warn the leaders of God's church, the people God gives his authority to, to lead his people. He warns them very specifically against this very thing and tells them to avoid it. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. He says, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You see, because God has set up a structure of authority within his church and within his kingdom, therefore Peter knew that there would be a temptation for men to abuse that authority and that trust. So he comes out and says, very quickly, you can't do this. Like it's the Spirit of God spoke that and he wrote it down for us to guard us against it. He knew that there would be a temptation for people to abuse that authority. And what happens when people abuse that authority in God's kingdom and God's church is it makes people distrust all authority. Because if you should be able to trust any authority, it should be the authority of the people that God puts over you, right? The shepherds of the flock. And when we can't trust the authority in the church, we can move so far as to go to the place where we distrust even the authority of God in our lives. And very few of us would say we distrust God's authority. Very few of us would confess that or express that with words or or even admit it in our own life. But the sad reality is, is that most of us, or should I even say all of us on some level, are very skeptical or perhaps even rebellious when it comes to God's authority. We don't, we don't have to say it with our mouths. We don't have to express it with our lips. We can see it in our lives. We don't obey the very obvious commands of the Lord. The most obvious. We, we don't even have to get into the nuances of Scripture. We're not even keeping the Ten Commandments. We live our lives outside of the counsel of God. We go our own way. We do our own thing. We make our own rules. Yeah, we follow what suits us, we, we know what it says, and we follow it when it suits us and what suits us, but the rest of it, well, we just kind of let it slide. And then we wonder why we can't hear God speak. I think many times it's because we are unwilling to submit to His authority in our life. And please, church, hear me, I'm not preaching at you. I am just as prone to this temptation as you are. I'm just as prone to this stuff as you are. Submission is never easy, not for anyone, not ever. It never has been easy and it never will be easy. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, a perfect place created by God. 
And God, in his authority, said, don't eat that one thing. And what did they do? They failed to submit to God's authority, and they decided to eat that fruit anyway. And that disobedience, no, let's call it what it is, that sin, that rejection and that rebellion against God's authority has been a stain on every human ever since. This is dangerous stuff when you get outside of God's authority. And I'm convinced, as I consider the testimony of Scripture, I'm convinced that God speaks to those who are willing to sit under and submit to His authority. Job was one of those kinds of men. Look at Job 23, long before God speaks. In Job 23, we see this. It says, yet he knows the way I have taken. This is Job. He says, he knows the way I have taken when he has tested me. I will emerge as pure gold. He says, my feet followed in his tracks. I have kept to his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commands from his lips. I have treasured the words from his mouth more than my daily food. But he is unchangeable. Who can oppose him? He does what he desires. He will certainly accomplish what he has decreed for me. And he has many more things like these in mind. This was a man who was willing, even in the middle of the fire, to submit to God's authority over his life. In Job chapter 40, after God has responded to Job and given him all those questions, listen to what Job said in Job 40, verses 1 through 5. It says, The Lord answered Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. And then Job answered the Lord. Here's his answer after all of God's questions. Job says, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply twice. But now I can add nothing. He says, who am I to say anything to you? You're God. Who am I to question you? Who am I to complain to you? Who am I to do anything except put my hand over my mouth and shut up? He said, I've already spoken once and I screwed that all up so I'm not going to speak twice. What a man who just says, I'm just going to sit here under your authority. He says, I spoke foolishly before, and I'm not going to do that a second time. I submit to your authority over, your li- over my life. You do what you want, God. I want to share one more example with you before we move on. This one's from the New Testament. We see this encounter that Jesus has with the centurion. Listen to this in Matthew 8, 8 through 10. I want you to see how important authority is and submitting to it. It says, Lord, the centurion replied, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. He's talking to Jesus. But just as you say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I too am a man under authority. Having soldiers under my command, I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. This goes on for a bit, and then Jesus honors the request of this soldier to heal his servant. But what impressed Jesus the most here was the faith of this man, which was based solely on his understanding of authority. Church, I want you to catch this. Our submission to God's authority over our lives is an expression of our faith. When we submit to God's authority over our life, whatever that is, that is an expression of faith. And when we reject God's authority over our life, it's just the opposite of faith. And that's why it matters. That's why it matters if you really want to hear God speak. Now let me once again just be crystal clear here. God can speak to anyone at any time. I think of people like Pharaoh, who certainly wasn't following God, certainly wasn't even seeking God, and yet God sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh. God showed Pharaoh signs and wonders. God spoke in loud, thunderous ways so Pharaoh could hear and see. Or I think of Saul there on that road to Damascus. He's not following the Lord. He's persecuting the church. He's on his way to hurt the church. 
He's not following the Lord. He's not submitting to the Lord's authority at that point in his life. And still, God comes. Jesus comes and speaks with him. I'm not saying God will only speak to those who are submitting to his authority. There are a number of other people in Scripture we can think of who weren't submitting when God spoke to them. But the reality is this. The overwhelming majority of those people in Scripture that God speaks to are people who are submitting their lives to his authority. So if you want to hear God speak, focus on the who, not the how. Become the kind of person of faith that fits into the who, and then you don't have to worry about the how. He just will. God speaks to those who submit to his authority. Here's the last one for today. God speaks to those who surrender to his will. Now you might be asking, well, what's the difference between submitting to his authority and surrendering to his will you might be saying well those sound kind of like the same thing they do sound like the same thing but they're actually very different things because here's the deal it's possible to submit to an authority and never fully surrender your will it's possible to submit to the authority but not surrender your will let me give you some examples there, there are some, there may even be some in this room, certainly with the size audience we have outside of this room, I'm sure in this audience there are some who at some point in their life have heard the call of God on their life to go into ministry, to vocationally be a minister of God. You've heard that call in your life. And you've submitted to his authority by acknowledging that call. But you've never surrendered to his will. You've never surrendered your will in that matter, even though you've submitted to his authority. You may have submitted to his authority to the point that you're leading a Bible study or a home group or you're volunteering at a high level or some level in your church. Maybe you're otherwise outside of the church at the place you work doing great ministry and, and being led by God to do things. You've submitted to his authority and know that that call is on your life but for one reason or another, for one fear or another, for one set of circumstances or another, you haven't gotten to the place where you're ready to surrender your will to that call. Here's another one. There are hundreds of people in this church. Hundreds. Uh, we, we could give you a number. I could give you a list of names, but I'm not going to name any names, don't worry. But I'll tell you right now, there are hundreds of people in this church who have submitted to the authority of God and they have repented of their sins. They have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have said, you are my Lord and Savior. You are the authority of my life moving forward. But they have not surrendered to his will and been baptized. Knowing that the word of God says, repent and be baptized every one of you. They've submitted to God's authority, but they haven't surrendered to God's will. See, submitting to God's authority and surrendering to God's will are closely tied together, but they're not the exact same thing. And we've got to do both if we want to hear God speak. Job, Job was a man who not only submitted to the authority of God, he was willing to surrender his life. He was willing to surrender his will to the will of God. Look at Job 13, 15, long before God speaks. Job says this, Even if he kills me, I will hope in him. I will still defend my ways before him. In Job 1, after learning that all of his children were dead, after learning that all of his livestock had been stolen, after learning that all of his servants were dead, after learning that basically everything he had in all this world was torn away from him in the course of a single day, his response is one of surrender. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Church, that's a man who's surrendered. And I pray that this kind of surrender will mark our lives and define us as God's people. I, I pray that this kind of surrender will be what defines us as a church and as the people of God. I pray that we might be able to proclaim as the psalmist did in Psalm 40 verse 8. 
That we might be able to say, Lord, I delight to do your will. And your instruction is deep within me. That my desire is to accomplish your will, whatever it is. That our passion would be one of full surrender to the will and the ways of God. And as is true in all things, Jesus is our model for this. Jesus was willing to surrender to the will of God. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In Luke 22, in the garden, Luke records this from Jesus. Then he, Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and began to pray. And here's what he prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's total surrender to the will of God. I really do believe that God speaks to those who surrender to his will. As we close and prepare to move into another week, walking with God as his people, as his church, as his disciples, I want to encourage you to listen for the voice of God in your life. And I want to remind you again, just forget about the how and start focusing on the the who. If you want to hear God speak, be the kind of person he speaks to. Let me show you before we close one more cool thing about God's will. Look at John 6 with me. I want you to know this before we leave today. You're a part of God's will. Did you know that? You are a part of God's will. Look at what Jesus said here in John 6, 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he's given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Look at verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, say amen if you're an everyone, that everyone, that's all of you, everyone, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. You are a part of the will of God. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to repent. He wants you to confess. He wants you to know His Son, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. He wants to have an eternal relationship with you. He wants to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. He wants to welcome you in to the gates of heaven. He wants to cleanse you from all of your sin. He wants to make you new. You are a part of the will of God. Will you submit to his authority? Will you surrender to his will? And will you take a moment right now to listen in silence and see if he is calling your name? Let's pray. If you are here this hour and have never given your life to the Lord, you have never been forgiven of your sins. If you don't know this very moment what would happen if today was your last day, not with the stuff you would leave behind, but with your eternal soul, if you don't know if you would go to heaven or hell, I would remind you one last time that God's will is that you would be saved. It's why he sent Jesus. It's why he died on that cross. It's why he rose from the dead and conquered the grave. So you could live. But the Bible says you must repent, confess, and believe. So we give you an opportunity to do that here, not by walking an aisle, raising a hand, or standing up, but by praying with us. If that's you, just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new and whole. I ask by faith that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life.
I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Father, we thank you for the message of hope that the gospel brings to our lives. For the sacrifice you made for each and every one of us on the cross, we thank you for our new brothers and sisters who are about to, for the first time in their lives, take the Lord's Supper as a child of the King. Father, we thank you that you still speak. We thank you that you're still moving and that you're still working. Lord, I pray you would honor the sacrifice of time that these who have gathered here to worship you and praise you this morning have given. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them this week. Father, help us to be the who and stop worrying about the how. We trust you. We ask your blessing on this time at your table now. In Jesus' name, amen.